Good morning. Welcome to Fret Buzz, the podcast. My name is Joe McMurray. And I am Aaron Sefchik. And today we've brought in my friend Jennifer Gamel, who is an incredible jazz vocalist, flautist, and piano player. Um, she won the 2018 Veer Award for the Jazz Album of the Year for her album Heart, Soul, and Fire. Um, the Veer Awards are a Hampton Roads Regional Award, so um, big congrats to her for that. And uh, we're excited to have you. Excited to be here. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, so for everybody out there that doesn't know, I have a jazz duo called Blue Orpheus, and uh, Jennifer and I perform around the region. Last night we played at Town Center, Virginia Beach. Um, had a great crowd. It was it was hot, but people were hanging out in the shade, and I think at the best point there, you know, 100 people sitting out there. At least, yeah. It was a really nice, really nice gig. Yeah. And um, yeah, so... Jennifer, I think it makes sense to kind of get your background and how you have come to be a professional musician. Mm -hmm. um, when did you start uh, studying music? Like, did you start on piano? I started on piano. I was about six and I, like I came home from church and I was picking out melodies on the piano and my, my older brother and sister were already taking lessons. And so uh, my parents got me started. Uh, yeah, back then. So did you take piano lessons for like all the way through high school? I took them till I was 16. Mm -hmm. um, what, you know, what type of teacher did you have? Did you have a, a very classical teacher? I wish it had been more classical. I learned how to read music, but I, she didn't develop my ear. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I was playing like advanced music, but it, I was very sloppy. Like she wasn't she wasn't hard enough on me or she could have passed me on to another teacher when she saw my potential. Uh, so, you know, but I didn't know any better. My parents didn't know any better. So. Is that the same teacher that your siblings is, went to as well? Yes. Are any of your other siblings still performing? No, they're all like naturally musically gifted. Uh, my brother was a drummer for quite a while and he was even on my first album, my first original album. Um, but yeah, he doesn't really play anymore. <laughs> so when did you pick up the flute? Uh, so that was in fifth grade when we could start it at school. And I just, I don't, I don't know why I picked it, but I just, that was what I, my mom wanted me to play clarinet and cause that's what she played. And I was like, no, I want the flute. So yeah, I started, started uh, in school. And then my friend, my best friend also played flute and she started taking private lessons from a local teacher and she started getting better than me which was not okay with me. <laughs> so, so I started getting lessons from the same lady and that, that was like a huge, like that was like the kind of training I got on flute was what I wanted to get and what I should have gotten on piano. Mm -hmm. So yeah, doing all the local, um, up in upstate New York, all the local competitions and all state and do, you know, graded solos and all that. So you're doing flute and piano concurrently. Did you have an equal love for both instruments? Hmm. I guess so. Yeah, it's hard to say. I, and I remember at some point when I actually did get some really tough piano lessons, uh, they really kicked my butt uh, when I was around like 16 for about six months. And that was like the classical training that I really needed. So at that point, I was thinking of doing both piano and flute in college. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, yeah, I was always playing both. So were yeah. you in the, the high school marching band? I went to a very small private school, so we didn't have a marching band. We had just a regular band. Uh, so, yeah, no marching band. <laughs> you didn't play at any any sporting events? Mm-mm. <laughs> just remember, because I was in the orchestra, but I always, the band, while that looked fun, you did have to, at least at my school, I think you had to, you know, play at the, in the after school marching band or the pep band for the basketball games or. Yeah. I, I, like a lot of extra effort. Yeah, it seemed, I always thought it seemed like fun. <laughs> but I did play in the, uh, so it, um, my junior and senior year, I played in the Syracuse Symphony Youth Orchestra. So my my training on flute had, you know, I had gotten good enough to where I got into that local orchestra. And that was very pivotal, you know, very much more of like a professional kind of step up from where I had been and very, very uh, instrumental in my formation, I guess. Yeah. So none of this had any, you know, there's no jazz 
in the high schools. No, no, there. no, jazz where I went. No. <laughs> um, when did that start to develop? I, after school, after college? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I remember in college, like going to see, because I went to school near Rochester, New York, and uh, there was a little bit more culture there. Or maybe I was just at that point where I was going out and doing stuff. And I remember going to see like jazz trios or go to a jazz club. And, it, you know, I thought it was fascinating. I had no idea what was going on. And I remember my teacher at that time, like asking him to teach me some jazz chords on piano. And that didn't, I don't know, for some reason it didn't really happen. Uh, but yeah, so I was always just fascinated with the harmony, you know, the structure and, you know, just kind of like that other that I couldn't quite grasp. I didn't know what it was. Yeah, it's hard to explain to people. Like, I remember wanting to learn, like, how do you play a jazz scale? Not knowing mm -hmm. that that's yeah. not really a thing. It's just still a scale. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but um, yeah, and jazz chords are just seventh chords or mm -hmm. adding extra notes on top. And more extra notes. <laughs> yeah, lots of extra notes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't want to get into it now, but I want to, at some point, I want to ask you about how you, your approach to actually um, fingering jazz chords on the piano. But okay. let, we'll come back to that. But I would like to know, um, we love hearing about people's um, experiences in music school. We've had mm -hmm. on uh, in, or musicians from who've gone to Berkeley and George Mason and Maryland and where did Dr. Purcell go? It was uh, in oh. Pittsburgh. Uh, Duquesne. Duquesne. Mm -hmm. So we've had people from all over. So mm -hmm. um, we'd love to get your experience. Yeah. So so it kind of picks up where you know I was in the youth orchestra and I, you know I was very much looking for looking to a career in classical music. You know probably being in an orchestra. And, and my teacher even had a few schools picked up for me, like where she had gone to Oberlin. So that was kind of her top choice, you know, but I would apply for a couple others. And, and at the same time, like, so I was very, very strongly brought up in the church. My dad was a pastor. And so I was also like leading worship, you know, from age 15 at his church. And so then my parents were kind of like, well, we want you to go to the path of, you know, music ministry, worship music. And, you know, when you're when you're 18, you don't really know, you know, how to make those choices for yourself, or at least I didn't. Um, and so, you know, wanting to please them and kind of feeling like it was like the noble thing to do. I went to Bible school and studied, you know, music ministry. So I was studying like music and, you know, always doing music, uh, but it's very different than music conservatory. So, uh, but I mean, I think the, the beautiful thing in it is that even though I didn't go to music school and I used to regret that for a long time, it's like, I still, I'm still working in music. I'm still performing. I'm, you know, and then like later I was able to, once I was able to refocus, like, what do I really want to do that I could go back and get the training that I needed. So, you know, I think that you don't have to feel like you have to make, you know, if you're going into college, I have, this is like the be all end all of what I'm going to do with my career. Cause you know, a lot of people, whether it's music or not, they don't do what they went to school for. Like Joe, you went to school for engineering, engineering. Yeah. And, uh, and then later you, you know, turn around and decide to do music. So it's just, yeah, I mean, it, it's, I think it's a lot of pressure on a, a teenager to, you know, here's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So, um, yeah. And so from uh, the Bible school I went to, then I was able to enroll directly in Regent and which is how I got to be in Virginia beach. And there I did like a theology track with a worship kind of concentration. Uh, and again, studying worship leading, you know, some emphasis on the music part. Um, but I was always, you know, I was a, I was playing in a church at that time. I was, you know, leaning for the chapel services, stuff like that. Uh, so that's, that's, that was my school experience at that time. So in like what courses musically related did you take at Regent? Did you take lessons with uh, a teacher? No, because I mean, Regent doesn't, I think they're just starting to start a music program, like in the undergrad, but at that time it wasn't actual, it was just a worship leadership course. So we would have guys from like 
some of the major at the time record labels, the Christian record labels come in and do the courses. So, and you know, so they were skilled and, and we would talk about like, we did talk about songwriting, about structure, about how do you structure a, a worship set? How do you lead your people? How do you organize volunteers? That kind of thing. That was, yeah. How do you structure a worship set? <laughs> Uh, typically like in the contemporary setting, it's, um, you do a couple like upbeat songs, get, get people engaged. They call it praise. And then you might do like a mid tempo song, then a couple slower songs, like, you know, where you're kind of entering more into that, you know, like presence or kind of worship atmosphere. So I haven't been asked that question in a long time. <laughs> I mean, is this, is there speaking going on between these songs or is there a certain story that you're trying to tell through this the actual lyrics of the music um yeah, it depends on the church some some pastors want the worship to kind of coincide with the sermon so they'll say like okay here's my passage or here's my kind of point for the week so can you kind of build the songs around that other churches it's very fluid and very like just the the leader picks out the songs and goes with those is yeah. but is it like is there sp- does he talk between the songs or is it just like a straight concert? Not usually. It's more like, well, it's a participatory, you mm-hmm. know, the, the congregation is supposed to sing along. Um, it's, it, it's, it's really like the worship leader, like he's leading that he or she's leading that portion of the service. The pastor's leading the sermon part of the service. Okay. It's amazing how much, I mean, you just to have that opportunity to every Sunday go and get, to perform in front of a lot of people who are, you know, very, um, maybe, I don't know if forgiving is the word, but like this, you're not supposed to be a professional musician up there, right? You're in high school. Like when you started out. Oh, when I started out. It seems like a great, a very like, oh, wonderful yeah, yeah. opportunity as a, a youth, yes. you know, a young person to get to go up and perform every weekend. Yes, yes. And it was like, it was, you know, I was doing keys and singing my brother was playing drums our friend learned how to play the bass for you know for the band the worship band you know our friend played guitar and it, yeah so it, it yeah and you'll actually hear a lot of uh you know professional musicians they started in church because yeah it is a forgiving environment in that sense yeah <laughs> my first show was at a church <laughs> See? <laughs> you were you were not playing worship music though i don't think right no I played Spirit in the Sky by Norman Greenbaum. Nice. Did, did you guys have like, did you rent out the church to have a concert? No, 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 no. We were, we were, we were the youth group and of the church and we were putting on our own show. Yeah. It's a, it's a free, it can be a free uh, space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't think I've ever performed at a church, <laughs> but anyway, um, so for everybody, has anybody, have you guys all seen um, Anchorman? No. You haven't seen Anchorman, Aaron? I don't watch television. <laughs> it's a movie. I don't watch movies. Well, you're you're missing out on this wonderful scene um, <laughs> where uh, Will Ferrell, he's the main character. Um, he, They're at a jazz club or at a restaurant, and he whips out a flute and like gets up on the tables, and he's playing... This like awesome jazz flute solo. Yeah. And, uh, and they call it the jazz flute. Yeah. <laughs> and he starts off going, they're like, oh, get up there. And he goes, oh, I, I dabble. And then, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> and then he starts playing and everybody's like, oh. Yeah. So essentially, that's what uh, Jennifer can do. <laughs> Doesn't, you, you don't you usually forgot. dance on tables, but. And then you forgot the part where he, then he, he sips up alcohol with his flute. Oh, yeah. And then he lights it on fire. He does do yeah. that. So occasionally people ask me if I will do that. And I say, hell no. <laughs> Seems like a great way to ruin the pads on your... Ruin the whole thing, yeah. Yeah. What, and would it even work? Because you there's so many holes in a flute. Like, could you actually sip it up? I've never... You'd tried. have to close all the pads, I guess. Close all the holes. <laughs> anyway. Great movie. Um, yeah, Jennifer can actually do some of that and... She gets into beatboxing on the flute, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Actually, do you have your flute nearby? Um, 
Yeah, it's so, I mean, I can go get it. I think that it would be awesome to demonstrate that. You want me to just do like a minute, something like that? Yeah, just do whatever you want. It could be 20 seconds, a minute. But I, yeah, definitely show us some beatboxing. Okay. nice That's awesome <laughs> yeah very cool yeah 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 there's a guy named greg patillo and he is the master at beatbox flute uh his stamina is amazing because for me i don't work on it enough to like be able to do it for minutes on end so one of my new things is i'll like loop just the beat or something and or beatbox and then i'll lay over that so yeah that's so cool so you're in order to, you're just beatboxing right into the mouthpiece while you're right. between right, right. the notes. Right, right. Normal beatbox, to, and, and their mouth positions might be a little bit different, you know. So, but with the flute, and I watched some of his like beginner videos to learn how to do it, and then you're just doing it over and over and over again to try to get it. So it's like a, I'm just doing that. But it's almost like a pop though, but I'm doing it while I'm blowing, huh. and then the. And then that's your hi hat. Yeah, it takes a lot of practice because you're you're actually you know you're doing two things at once. You're trying to keep the beat, and yeah, that is very cool. <laughs> Man, so I'm glad that we've we've <laughs> shown yeah. the world that that's that's a thing. <laughs> Greg Patillo is that? I mean, does he have a book out or just YouTube videos? Um, so he has videos, he does like clinics, he goes all around to like schools. Um, and he, he also has a trio, it's called Project Trio. So it's like him and a cello and a, it might be an upright bass or something like that, but it's, a, there's a trio and he, he just goes crazy with that. Uh, but he's also a very good classical flutist, but he wrote this piece called Three Beats for Beatbox Flute. So it's an actual transcribed, you know, piece. And then it has all these different notations, you know, for the different beatboxing things. So, and I've, I've actually, I worked on that a, a good bit a while back. So that helps you get like different techniques than what you usually use. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, let's jump over to um, maybe you're, now you currently teach large groups of kids. Um, what What's the program called again? Young Audiences of Virginia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can you uh, explain what the format of that is? So we go into public schools, uh, mostly public, and we do workshops and we do uh, performances. And it's it can be like part grant funded. It can be part like school funded. Or a lot of times it's a match. You know, the school fun funds part of it. The grant funds part of it. And it's as long as it has you know, say they have like a, this one has to have an educational, you know, thrust to it or meet certain SOL criteria that a lot of times we have to kind of work with those, but we have like, um, you know, the, the people at the office who work with us on content and stuff like that, making sure we're meeting things like that. So an SOL for everyone out there, those in Virginia, in the state of Virginia, it's the standards of learning. It's just the criteria that teachers are supposed to it's like specific information they have to cover for topic yeah, and the kids have tests on it every year oh yes i hear whining every year <laughs> yeah we we yeah. had end of grade testing in huh. uh, north carolina same idea but yeah we had some something in new york for it yeah this giant stressful thing <laughs> looming all year uh-huh yep um so you go in and you're teaching do you actually hand out instruments or is this more 
based on singing or anything in particular? There's a, there's a huge gamut of what they teach us. It's like almost anything in the arts. Like some people do dance. Some I've done actually, uh, I've done quite a few like theater workshops or camps. Uh, so it's like theater games, you know, teaching basic acting skills and games and stuff like that. Um, some of them are like, I know they've had some strings programs and stuff like that. So, you know, somebody who's skilled in that will go in and teach. Uh, I've done a lot of like songwriting workshops, which is really interesting when you're working with like fairly young kids, you know, and yeah. So songwriting, um, what else have I done? I've done a lot of stuff. <laughs> well, ex explain how would you would approach a songwriting class. Yeah, so I try to take, um, what I'll do is I'll take a couple very simple melodies. Like I'll take like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and I'll just point out like, why is this an enduring melody? You know, and I'll point out the repetition or the movement of the melody. Like, and I'll kind of chart it out, not with notes, but just kind of like the movement up and down. And, you, and it's amazing when kids see it, they're like, oh like it, you know it just has never occurred to them to think about it in like a structured way and like why does this happen you know what's the kind of the form or the pattern or the structure and then when you say to them and this is also the melody for you know the abc song and for row or uh what's the other one baba black sheep and they go they're like oh i mean some kids kind of know that or but very few a lot of kids like have no idea that it's the same melody and and so then you know maybe i'll take like a more modern song and kind of point out like or take something like over the rainbow you know and i'll show like okay it does this and and then it takes it on a different note and does the same pattern so i try to point out what are melodic kind of you know things that go on in a song and then i'll talk about <clears throat> like i use a lot of like literary devices when i write so i'll talk about um you know metaphor simile you know so it like if you give them something specific like say okay describe the sunset to me you know using a metaphor using a simile so you give them little exercises like that or once they start writing um and i might either like team them up or you know have them write one line or I, i'll kind of coach them like we'll do it a group and then uh somebody give me an idea and i'll say like okay but let's put that in a little bit more poetic form or like you want to say what you're saying without saying this is what I'm saying. So, yeah. Do you then have them try to come up with a melody to sing that line? Sometimes. Yeah. Like, it, again, it depends on the age. Like, a, like if they're younger, it's a much more guided. Like I'll say, like, I'll, I'll start with something like, okay, here, this is what I've come up for this line. And they're like, oh yeah, I like that. Cause you know, <laughs> and then, but occasionally someone has had a really great idea for the next melody line or the next lyric line like you know better than i would have come up with so it's it's really cool to see that kind of come out of the kids what ages are you talking about here like when you say young kids do you mean like kindergarten no i don't i don't think they've ever had me do that with kindergarten uh probably starting at like second third grade but i mean the majority probably would be like fourth and fifth grade or fifth sixth do you is there usually a piano there and you can where you could like yeah, whatever. I can try to request that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Usually we can either get one, like I'm either in the auditorium or in a classroom. Yeah. yeah. So are you? You're paid to go in, and you're just paid by the session, essentially. Is that mm -hmm. how that works? Yep. And you're doing this with a group of other teachers as well, or is it just solo you? It depends on the residency. Uh, so like we did one that was an after school thing and it was for, um, so because they're grant, a lot of them are grant funded, like this one was for military children. We have a huge, huge military population here. So they wanted to focus on like, how can we uh, use the arts to help, you know, kids who are constantly in transition, how can they use the arts to like help express themselves? And it's something they take with them each place they go. So on that one, we had a group of three artists and then we had a few teachers helping out. And so we would we would do some things like all together as a group, and then we might break off for the rest of the, you know, of the duration and the, each, the, the groups um, kind of rotate around so that you're working with a smaller group. Uh, and then occasionally, like I have some workshops coming up where it'll be just me with <laughs> anywhere from like 
10 to 25 kids, sometimes you get surprised when you get there, <laughs> how many kids there are. Right. Yeah. And a workshop duration, how long would a day, a week? Month? Anywhere. Oh, a, an individual session is like 45 minutes to probably an hour and a half max. Okay. Uh, and then it can go like, um, it, usually it's about five weeks. So I'll go once a week for those five weeks. Okay. Or I have some in the summer where it's like I go for four days for that workshop, you know, because they have some summer sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Do you build on like songwriting for the yes. time? You take yeah. the same subject and just build yeah. on it. Yeah. And you can't guarantee you'll have the same kids, but you do your best. Yeah. Now you You don't have but a few private students, correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Because the hours are after school, I want to be with my kids. Uh, so I teach my kids and I have two neighbor kids that I teach. Do you find you're able to connect with the students in the larger group? I mean, like, I guess the it's so powerful being able to teach privately to me because you do get to have the, build these relationships. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like you've gone to the same schools enough to start, you know, knowing the kids a bit? I'll, I'll recognize kids or it's like you build up that little bit of rapport over those weeks, you know, and then a lot of times they're like, oh, we're so sad you're not coming back, you know, so and it, it's kind of like with private teaching. Some kids you'll connect with more than others. Some will gravitate toward you and connect with you. Uh, it's, it's just different in a group um, and you can't like have favorites, you know, so I don't know, but I, I actually enjoy it more than I because I used to teach privately a lot and I enjoy the group more somehow. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. They each have their benefits. I think obviously with a private lessons, you can have that one on one interaction. But with a group, it's kind of nice because you can set a you can set a certain group, smaller group of students on a task. And while right. you're working on that, you can kind of direct your attention to another group and kind of keep yes. this constant ball rolling down the hill, which is kind of exciting because there's always action going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a common, yeah, a common tactic I'll use is break them up into groups, and then I'll go around and help as they're working. Yeah. Aaron, you, I know you teach bands, but do you ever teach uh, like group guitar lessons or anything like that at Bach to Rock? Uh, uh, I used to. I don't currently, just because I have my schedule's completely loaded with private and mostly actually bands. I've got like twelve bands. So wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what? Yeah. I, I'm, yes. I, I feel like hands. when I was working with you, I don't think anybody had more than a, a few at that time. Yeah. Like a handful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my experience is coaching bands. Like I, I had a band at Bach to Rock that I coached for a while. And I've, I've coached some bands with uh, Music Makers, which is a local Virginia Beach kind of school of rock type um, school of music. Um, I always felt like it was more work for me. I, I really enjoy it, but I found that I had to know all the repertoire better. I had to know all the, be able to play all the different instruments for the song. So I feel like 12 bands at once would be exhausting. <laughs> it can be, uh, but I don't know that, I mean, you're doing a song at a time. Most of the time you're rehearsing uh, past stuff to make sure that you're keeping on top of your game, uh, that you don't forget anything special little, for little kids. Um, uh, yes and no. Some of them I have them going through songwriting exercises. Some, I mean, it's a little bit of everything. And yes, it keeps you on your toes all the time. Um, whereas private lessons, you, you do have a chance to be able to sit back and kind of let the student do their thing if they're working on a specific thing you can kind of just sit back and watch them and throw in a couple pointers and um but yeah I, I don't mind it it's um it's exciting it keeps the job exciting and it's it's okay i i just like bands i like i like that that interaction that communication and trying to get yes it can be frustrating obviously at times um but to be able to sit there at any one of those frustrating times and go, this this is my job. That this is pretty all right. Yeah, so. you're yep. <laughs> like we're right right at ninety five degrees. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you guys have do you still have that monster that what was it like a JCM eight hundred in the we got the J band room? Yeah, we've got the Marshall uh the Marshall's I it it's dead. 
Uh, but we still have the the RIP. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, but we still got the other half stack and the SVT and yeah, yeah. So last night after Jennifer and I's gig, I went out. They're having this big festival in Virginia Beach called Sandstock, hmm. and they like took the Woodstock poster with like the guitar head and the pigeon or the dove sitting on it and they've had all these tribute bands so on friday it was like santana and foreigner anyway last night was boston the boston tribute band so i got out there and i caught the very end of it and um you know you walk out onto the beach you take your shoes off they've got beer tents and food tents and it's just a big free show and they had awesome amps i mean they had several mar or two Marshall full stacks and giant bass amp. I mean, it was, it was incredible. Big giant amps cool. sounded awesome. It sounded like that. Just like, it sounds like they put so much, it's like a treble boost that gets you that, that sound. And I guess through a Marshall or a Vox too. That's what Brian May did, right? No, were they playing through a PA system or were they just, it was, a, it was a, like, as if you went to the amphitheater, it was a full on production soundboard, you know, out in the middle of the crowd, thousand people or a couple thousand. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it was a, it was a serious setup. A little light show going on. And oh, yeah. Okay. I'll send you a video. Yeah. 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 Um, I'll put it in the video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, I got excited thinking about, about, I used to get to play through that big Marshall half stack at Bach yeah. Rock every once in a while. Um, so, Anyway, back to uh, teaching. Um, <laughs> actually, it's a, not a bad segue. Your songwriting, since you teach kids songwriting, um, your songwriting is, to me, it, it reminds me of uh, Nora Jones a bit, and you've you've brought up Sarah Bareilles, but mm -hmm. it's it's poppy at times, but it's very jazzy, like undeniably jazzy, and the chord changes, the chord structure is far more complex than your average pop song yeah um, so i i enjoy that that you're able to take complex harmonic structures and make them appealing to the you know average person <laughs> that's the goal <laughs> yeah. um and you're also a phenomenal lyricist thank um, you yeah but so can you talk about your I, i'm sure you've you, you may have multiple approaches to songwriting but if you were to sit down and work on a song, how would you go about writing that song? Yeah, so usually I get lyrics first. So a lot of times it's just something I'm going through or, you know, just even just writing thing, writing down, you know, uh, emotions and all that, sorry, lyrics mm -hmm. is very cathartic for me. So, and sometimes it's just writing and other times it's like, okay, this definitely is going somewhere as a song. And I almost always write like rhythmically, like so something will come out, thought will pop into my head and I'll write it down. And so then the next line or the next thought, I'm consciously thinking like, what was the rhythm of that first line? So I'm trying to follow that as I go and not just write stream of consciousness. So in that way, I feel like it's already kind of lending itself to a certain, you know, feel or style or whatever it is. And uh, I might have a kind of a melody in my head. I might not. And then, and then as I go, I always leave myself open to like recrafting the lyrics, reworking the melody or the structure. So probably I would write like a verse or a verse and a chorus. And then I might come back like the next day and like add some more to it until I feel like I have enough for a song. And then I'll sit down at the piano and I try to, I try to kind of like let, you know, like, you know how like uh, writers say the, the story writes itself. So I kind of try to let the song write itself and not like, like using my knowledge of theory to kind of craft it and make it go somewhere, but also kind of like letting, you know, like what is the melody doing? Let's structure around that. Like, I, I guess like trying to craft it, but not be too, um, too like theoretical about it. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And then I just, you know, that I, one of the classes I took, it said songwriting is half inspiration and half perspiration. So I, you know, I very much, you know, use that 
the work part of it to, you know, and I, I like the challenge of, I want to get this to the point where it's ready. It's, it's a song or it's ready to be performed or recorded or produced. Um, so, so that's what it is for me, just keeping on reworking it. And um, at this point I don't have many other like songwriters, you know, that I can kind of bounce off of. I have a few people that I'll send something to like, Hey, how does this sound? Or are these lyrics too weird or whatever? Uh, but I, I would enjoy that. I would say having more like feedback on a peer level as, as far as songwriting. It seems like you, you write your melodies and then do you go back and, I mean, do you even have a key in mind or do you just, just play the melody and then you harmonize the melody? Yeah, I'll usually kind of see where it's sitting on my voice. And, you know, sometimes I'm in a, like a really bad key that it's going to be a bad key for performing, either too low, too high. So sometimes I'll just change it to kind of cater to that. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, it's, I don't know. I guess it's both melody and a few songs I've written where like I just had the melody in my head like I was like I was like on the road or I was like at a park and so I got the whole melody in my head and then I went home and put the chords with it and I feel like those songs actually were really good because it was like the melody kind of dictated the the chord structure so I didn't think about it too much so <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question <laughs> yeah it's really interesting I often will take the opposite route where uh -huh. I, I have my chord structure figured out and then I'll kind of write a melody that weaves through those chords. Kind of like it's, mm -hmm. I think it's because of so much jazz soloing. I, I kind of think like that more naturally mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. And it's especially fun, you know, when you, when you're not actually improvising in real time and you can, you know, oh, make yeah. it, weave it perfectly through the chords. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I need to try that. I need to, you know, I've done it before, but I, I don't do it enough. Mm -hmm. Have you written any songs recently? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of always writing. So it's uh, like, even if I'm not like specifically working on a song, I'm usually writing down lyrics here and there. And then it's, I always write them in my notes app on my phone and then I come back to it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I have enough songs written for another album. So I'm just trying to figure out at this point, uh, how I want it produced. Um, and it, this one's a little, I'd say these, this batch of songs is a little bit less jazz, a little bit more pop, but I mean, it's still very, you know, there's some of them are still very bluesy, very funky. Um, so I, and I guess I, I try, I, because I've been studying so much of like the online music business and all that, I'm probably trying to be a little bit more commercially, you know, I guess plausible. A little bit more, you know, with without selling out, without like being like bubblegum pop, because I don't, I don't like that. So I like that term, bubblegum pop. Yeah, I used it in an ad that I wrote, <laughs> that I wrote for Facebook. <laughs> yeah. When you're when you're writing your different uh, songs, say blues or jazz, and you have your you have your melody already figured out with the rhythm. Are you purposely going into because you just have a base foundation of that melody? So do you already have the idea of what the song is going to be in terms of genre or does that happen real time? Uh, I probably already have an idea of it. Okay. You know, because whether I kind of that, that whether the melody is like, okay, these are going to be more just like triad chords or this one, like stepping out on air is very much like all minor sevenths and dominance and and then i don't even know like subdominance and like <laughs> some and sometimes i write or like i hear a chord and i and i don't even know theoretically what it is but i'm like oh, okay this sounds really good right so um yeah and i'm always try, trying to kind of stretch those boundaries of like what's because you don't want to go too far out to where like it doesn't sound at all familiar at all right you know plausible right. but still stretching ears you know and you're doing all this on the piano yes yeah I, somebody asked me if i wrote on flute and i was like no <laughs> because you know i was a pianist first so and that's just where you know obviously chords it's like that's yeah 
so fingering jazz chords if you were to take a okay a c major seven how would you finger that with two hands i know there are multiple ways but what's kind of your go-to mm -hmm. so i probably play like the c and the bass and then if i'm using some rhythm i'm going to play the fifth the g and then in the right hand i'm going to play a b e g so try you try to leave out the root in, in the, the right, right hand, hand. Uh, so yeah, and then I might add in the nine, the, the D, or just depending on the song. Yeah, you can use all your colors in there. Okay, yeah. I, uh, I mean, I've seen you play some before, and your left hand, what you showed me with your left hand, like, changed my world. On the <laughs> Using and, rhythm, yeah. Yeah, that kind of just rocking between the, the root and the fifth, or going root fifth octave, or... Mm -hmm. It just sounds huge. Thank you. But, you know, but yeah, so it's interesting how you you just leave that root out of the, because you don't need it in the right hand. Mm -mm. Yeah, so it, one of, if anybody's like trying to like do, like learn some basic jazz chords, like I honestly used, there's a free Jamie Abersold like little paper booklet that you can here. Exactly. So they send that to you. And at the back, there's, you know, uh, you know, just chords, here's some basic voicings. And I honestly used that for a long time, like just practicing through those changes because it is so different than pop. It's so different than how I was playing worship music or even my first like singer songwriter stuff because I didn't have that jazz training. Uh, so yeah, I went through that for a long time and then, uh, and then you've got to, you know, utilize it in your actual playing. And then I got a, a book called jazz piano book and it's by Mark Levine. I got it from Amazon. And so that one, I, I just very slowly am working through that. You know, I still have a ton to learn, but, um, you know, just like you, so you take like in a different voice or a different, uh, inversion work that two, five, one in that inversion, you know? So yeah, that's what kind of expands your, yeah, your, uh, your options, I guess you could say. Yeah, because yeah, if you're coming off of a certain chord, you don't necessarily want to like just move your whole right, hand, right, both hands just to that comfortable position. You want it to move, you know, stepwise or as close to that as possible, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. so that, you know, jazz guitar, it's kind of the same idea. Right. You start out and you just like you learn those basic shapes and you you just move your whole hand to where you're comfortable. But <laughs> as you get better, you try to not have to move around so much and it sounds more cohesive uh-huh yep exactly um aaron have you written anything recently uh with summer being here now <laughs> I've, kids have got me tied up but oh, I, I understand that <laughs> i mean it's just kids 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 <laughs> um but I did write something for the song club probably a month ago that I've been kind of mulling over. It's uh, I wanted to go simple, basic, um, kind of lyric forward, um, nothing too complex. Actually, it starts off with just four notes. It's really easy. Just something very, very uh, accessible is what, what I was kind of going for. Uh, every month, I'm just kind of trying to go a little bit of a different route for myself. You know, first month it was jazz, second month it was like singer songwriter. So I'm just kind of bouncing all around. You had that song, the the funk tune that you did. Yeah. Yeah, I need to finish that one as well. Yeah. I'd like to do some like EDM. <laughs> just have some fun with it. Yeah, you need Ableton. It's fun. Yeah. I think it's it's important as a musician just to, you know, even though I would Personally, I would never put out an album that has, you know, each track a different genre. <laughs> uh, you, someone obviously could do that and do it pretty well. Uh, but I think it's just more of an experimentation. And uh, for me, it's just important to just kind of always push yourself forward and always try new things. Uh, they may not be successful and most of them aren't, but at least you've gone through that process. And the next song or five songs down the line, you you will have learned something from that process and and maybe you can incorporate that into a, a song that is very useful um mm -hmm. so yeah i, I always yeah. keep on writing that's for sure well and, and depending on where you're going with your career like 
you know, you can go into music licensing, which you can write every, every song can be a different style. If you know how to pitch it, you know how to, you know, um, just cause like in all my kind of studying, I've come across the different, different career paths you can use it, do as a musician. So. Yeah. Which not a lot of people are aware of. That's for sure. Right. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you talking about like, what is it? Taxi.com and like actually writing songs to be placed in ads and that sort of thing in movies yeah. and TV. Yeah. So there's taxi, there's song trader. There's a, um, a guy named Michael Elsner. If anybody's interested in that, Michael Elsner, he has a whole like kind of course that he'll take you through to, to uh, teach you how to do that. Cause he actually recommends contacting, like you go on IMDB and you like, okay, here's this TV show that uses music like mine. And you actually pitch directly to, like the music supervisors, which I think is pretty fascinating. So, yeah. Have you had any music placed in any sort of ad or television? Not really. I So I, I joined Song Trader and I had a song right away get like taken to the final step. And then at the final step, it wasn't chosen. And I was like, no. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's, I don't know what it is like. I guess with that stuff, I'm like, what am I missing? What's not, what's not uh, gelling? So I don't know yet. I, I haven't had the time to kind of pursue the licensing thing really hard. So yeah, I've I've thought about it before, but it's just not. I'm not an. Um, <clears throat> I don't write enough songs. Maybe it's just not my focus. Uh, like I yeah. like writing songs occasionally, but I don't think I could make a career out of needing to write a song every day. Yeah. Some yeah. people enjoy that. Oh yeah, some people too, make a lot. Yeah, a, a good living doing that. You know, writing jingles and right. doing commercials for local radio and local TV, as well as big productions. Mm -hmm. I'd rather write personally, fewer but very good songs. Mm -hmm. so less is more. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you have been to. Uh, two different big jazz conferences in New York City and in San Jose, California. Yep. Um, can you talk about why you went to these and what you um, gained from the experiences? Yeah, so I actually went because my my teacher and co-producer uh, for the album, when we were working on my album, he said, you know, I go to this conference every year. You need to come meet all the radio guys so that they know your face because you know they get so many submissions so he's like if they've at least met you they've made a connection they're much more likely to open your cd give it a listen so that was kind of the original goal and uh so i went to the one last year in january so it's called jazz congress in new york city it's in january and uh then i went to again this this year and uh I'd say this year was the first year I was really like, you know, scared and nervous. I was the new person, you know, like kind of hiding. <laughs> like, And then the second year I was like, Hey, you know, just like talking to people, meeting people. And the, the sessions were so good this past year. Um, I got to meet Grace Kelly, who's um, the musician. She uh, she's a saxophone player and just like shot up like in the past year or two. And it was just so inspiring hearing her story and like how she just started putting out like, videos and content. And so that's one of the things that kind of inspired me to start getting my online game a little bit more, you know, more in line. So, uh, yeah, super inspiring. You meet, you know, you get to meet all these great jazz people and see performances and, and all that. So that was pretty awesome. The one in San Jose is actually more for, uh, radio, like jazz radio people, but it's, it's also open to artists and, you know, whoever else. So that one's smaller, uh, but it was still like, I'm not going this year, but it was still pretty cool. Like, especially, I guess if you live out there, it's much more worth it. And this is, it was the same weekend as the San Jose jazz festival. So I got to catch a lot of that, which was, which was pretty incredible. And it was um, like, kind of like Joe, you were saying how the, the one in New Orleans, it was like such a huge spectrum of music. Same thing in San Jose. You have your traditional, you have your kind of like more experimental jazz, you know, and then you have your almost non-jazz, you know, or your soul or funk, whatever it is. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I didn't I didn't know that San Jose had a big jazz festival. Yeah. My favorite was probably the Latin the Latin stage cuz oh my gosh, they were just phenomenal and then you know you're dancing, you know, just the whole time. So it was great. I love I love Latin. Like Cuban music is so fun. Uh-huh. That it's just it is very uh it's very rhythmically driven and it does make you want to dance. Yeah. So at these jazz uh, conferences, do you have the opportunity to get uh, to sit in like any sort of technical seminars, like like uh, master classes or anything like that? They don't do a lot of that, but then again, I'm not usually choosing those kind of sessions to go to. So there might be a little bit of that. Yeah, I think there was some of like the DIY type of stuff, but. You know, I'm more focused on like the artists. Like I went to like, how do you go on tour? You know, how do you make an engaging video? That type of stuff. Those are the kind of workshops I was going to. Okay. Yeah. It seems very useful. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're, um, like you had previously mentioned, moving into online and obviously taking classes on you know, how to make the best video and whatnot like that. How is, how is that process going for you? And what does that look like? It is slow. <laughs> it's a, it's, it, I feel like it takes a long time before you see the, the rewards or the benefits, you know? So like this year I've really like, I've started an email list and, you know, working on how do I, you know, Oh, that's a whole different discussion. You know, how do, how do I engage my fans in my email list and, and kind of more the model of instead of trying to like throw your content out just to the world and like, let's make this, you know, huge, like I need a million plays, all this. Instead of you find your like 1,500 to 2,000 fans, yep, you like people who are actually going to love your music, then, and if you, you know, you put out content three and four times a year or you say, help fund my album this is the concept anyway then you can make a living as you know an artist just by that you don't have to be doing all you know what the big artists are doing and that's been kind of our model for a long time so but you know but you know i've been trying to so i've been working on that i've been uh being being more verbal even in shows about like hey i have an album because i like honestly i don't enjoy self-promotion but it's like i have to it's a necessity uh, if you're a brand. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a necessity. And so then putting out videos, constantly saying, here's my show, come to it, you know. And then um, you know, so kind of like being aware of all that and and trying to do your selling. Um, but at the same time, like I'm I'm also realizing, like, you know what, right now where I'm succeeding the most, where I'm making the most money is my performing. So it's okay for me to like, this is my focus, and let's use the performing to build my email list or to sell some albums or, you know, all that. So, you know, because there's so many different avenues you can go, like, you know, eventually, yes, I'd love to have tons of plays on Spotify, mm -hmm. but it's probably going to happen more organically by me reaching those actual fans, you know, than it is me paying someone to get my song played. Now, on your website, do you offer any coursework or books or anything like that? Not yet. Okay. No. Is that something in the future that you would like to work towards? I don't know. Okay. I mean, not at this point, no. I mean, maybe at some point I'd do something for songwriting, but mm -hmm. um, I probably need to have some hit songs before that <laughs> or anybody would trust me. <laughs> that seems like you could... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. seems like you could arrange um like the beatboxing flute tunes like you could make your own arrangements and mm -hmm. compile those or sell them for you know two dollars for this one two dollars for this other one right like like one one kind of marketing idea i have is to um i saw a lady who she did lyric art so she took like so she'd take a phrase from her song and you know put it on like a canvas and people can buy that so and since my daughter's an artist like I'm going to have her do some of the backgrounds. We'll put some of my lyrics on the front, you know? So it's, it's like, you're just, you constantly got to be creative and think about like, what's you, what do I have that's unique? Right. What do, 
you know, how can I use all these different facets and things in my life to make my brand, you know? So yeah, it's, it's uh, challenging, but fun. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the online, the online stuff is, it's an exhausting process. Yeah. I was just, yeah. It's just like it, every week it comes so fast. Like you just felt like you just, you just posted or you just <laughs> did something. Yeah. And sometimes you just want to take a break and oh. not think about it for a while. And yeah. yeah. You can use, um, but you can use scheduling software like, mm -hmm. like Hootsuite. Yep. So you say, say you take, okay, I'm going to take an hour every Monday and I'm just going to schedule out my posts for the week. And, you know, that's a way you can do it where you feel like you're not constantly having to, to be in it, in it. So yeah, I need to, I need to use that. That would be really good. I don't actually use it yet. I just know about it and it's, it's, it's on the it's somewhere, some, somewhere along the line. I'll get that <laughs> okay, to using it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But first you have to make content. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's the hard part. It's like one thing about scheduling it. That's that's sure. Hootsuite's great for that. But then there's the whole, I have to actually make the content to be, to be scheduled. Yeah. <laughs> well, and another, another really great tool that I just found out a few months ago is called canva.com. Yeah. Yeah, I use, I've been using Cam for yeah. years. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that makes it so much easier. You're not starting from scratch. You're like, oh, let's use this template, throw some text, you know. So, yeah. yeah. There is definitely a lot of cool tools out there for for your business to, to grow uh, you as a person online. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of the time and when you have a job and kids mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and chores and laundry and yard work yeah. yep. it's really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. and Aaron has a very large yard I thought you were going to say a very large family no <laughs> no more kids mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah how many do you have? I have two okay I have three yeah. So yeah. I have a dog I was going to say Joe you got <laughs> well, cool well I do you have any other questions here? No, no. If you if you could, Jennifer, uh, let everybody know where they actually can go to learn more about you. Okay. So my website is jennifergamel.com. It's G-A-M-M-I-L-L. -L. And I have all kinds of content on there, videos and music, and you can get a free song. You can sign up for my mailing list. And also a page of shows because I do perform pretty much every weekend. So you can catch me locally and... That's, that's my feel. <laughs> oh, also my album, <laughs> Heart, Soul, and Fire. You can find it on iTunes and Spotify. And but I make a lot more money if you actually buy it. <laughs> cool. yeah. Most people don't really realize that. I don't think. Spotify, you get about like a thousandth of a penny for a play, something like that. Well, thank you. It's been wonderful having you and. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. I do appreciate Thanks it. Awesome. Thank you, Jennifer. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.